Hello and a hearty welcome to New England Authors. We explore wonderful subjects here and we have a special program uh, that is very close to my heart. Uh, we're very honored to have the uh, Byron and Anita Wien, philosopher of dr uh, professor of drama and comparative li literature at Harvard. He has written extensively, including the great Norton anthology of world literature, which we all like. And we have a new book here called The Written World. Uh, Dr. Puchner, welcome to New England Authors. Thanks for having me. Okay, so it's it's just a beautiful book. First of all, it's beautiful in the inside with many <laughs> color uh, photos and uh, and great to read. And you bring uh, stories from the civilization that formed the written word from the very beginning. Why did you write this book? Well, I felt that they that in literary studies and in, in literary histories, we tend to focus on just one period or one century or, or one yeah. small episode. And I realized I'd never asked myself what the big picture is. What's the big story of storytelling? How did storytelling develop? When did writing intersect with oral storytelling? What was the big, big way in which storytelling propelled itself through history? How were the big stories, how, how did they shape the, the, the course of human history? And so I decided to zoom all the way out right. and, and try to put that story together. And what was the, f where did you start? What was the first? Well, yes. whenever you, you, you start with a story, it's good to start at the beginning. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I did. So the writing was invented about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Originally not for the purpose of writing down stories. It was invented to record economic transactions. It gave rise to a kind of state bureaucracy. Uh, it was really the domain of accountants. Uh, but at some point, one of these accountants decided to use this accounting technology for a completely different purpose, and that was to write down a story. And that, for me, was the big bang. That's the beginning of written stories, the beginning of literature. And so the first great text that arose from that, the first really great work of world literature, comes from that part of the world, from Mesopotamia, yeah. today's Iraq, and that's the epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh. and that's how I start. Yeah, you talk a lot about these foundation texts which seem to arise and develop in all these different cultures. Uh, what are their importance? And I think they're important because once they were written down, they became really crucial reference points for entire cultures. The fragments from the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, were yeah. found all over the Near East. And, and we can deduce from that that this text was really became a, a, a defining text for an entire region, for an empire that, that incorporated more and more parts of the, uh, of the Near East. So, so it's clear that because fragments were found all over the place, that a lot of people bought into the story, that, that the scribes who presided over them made sure that this story was exported to the outer reaches of their empire. And it shaped the way people told themselves the story of who they were, where this particular civilization came from, um, and what its most important values were. How, how, lo how big is it? How long is it? You know, it's not very long. Yeah. So the Epic of Gilgamesh was written on clay tablets with cuneiform writing. You make little incisions onto these clay tablets. And they're very small incisions. The tablets are only about not much bigger than, than the book, And the entire epic fit on 13 of these tablets. Oh, incredible. So um, uh, clay survives a lot better than papyrus and it, it, paper it, it, and so it, on. It, it sure did. It sure did. And it's the only reason why we actually have this epic. Because even though it was so important for one region, it, it disappeared with that cuneiform script because it was never translated into other languages. So sooner or later, the libraries in which this epic was housed burned down and everything in it burned as well. But as you suggest, because it was written on clay, clay, when it is you know, exposed yeah. to heat, hardens. And so it was baked in a, as if in a kiln. And that's why it survived for 2,000 years until it was rediscovered. So then you talk about the Phoenicians who uh, were centered in, yes. um, in Lebanon and traveled right. around the Mediterranean. They brought something special which the Greeks 
expanded on. And that was one of the most important innovations in, in the story of writing and that my story is really driven by different inventions and new technologies and one of those inventions is the one you allude to, namely the alphabet. The fact that you match letters to individual sounds, that you decompose words into individual sounds that don't have any meaning. The older signs all had meaning. Phonetic signs by themselves don't have any meaning. So it was an important and complicated process. But what you got from it was a, an extremely simple alphabet. Um, and since then, the alphabet has really taken over most of the world. It wiped out most of the older writing system. Not all. East Asia preserved non-phonetic writing. Yes. Uh, Could you give us a little bit about East Asia, what happened uh, with uh, their, their writing system, yeah. their development? So East Asia is actually a place of important innovations, but not of the alphabet. There are two other uh, innovations that come from China, which are maybe even more important than the alphabet. Bed, and that's paper and print. They were right. both. Yes. Uh, they were both invented in in China, and I, and I tell the story of those two inventions via the oldest surviving printed text in the world, and that's the Diamond Sutra, Buddhist Sutra, from the 9th century A.D. So many hundreds of years before the reinvention we now have to say yes. of print in in Northern Europe by Gutenberg, right. and so these religious texts like these Buddhist sutras became the early adopters of both paper and print because Buddhist monks were very invested in spreading the word of Buddhism. They wanted to proselytize. The Buddhist sutras themselves promised them rewards if they taught the content of the sutra to as many people as possible. So here come along these two and technologies, paper and print, that made the replication of these sutras much easier and much cheaper. And that's what these Buddhist monks did. They became early adopters of yes. new technologies. Interesting. So uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about Homer, Alexander the Great, uh, Gilgamesh, which you talked about, the Holy uh, Scriptures, um, yeah. uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, the U.S. Constitution. What do they have in common? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, yeah. you, you, you sketch the entire gamut, and, and I think you're right that it, it may look like this is a completely random group of texts. I, I'd say two things about them. One is that they are not just what we would call fiction. And that was important to me because once I started to think about which written stories had the biggest impact on human history, some of them were fictional or quasi-fictional stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Homeric epics. But others were text sto written stories that we would consider political texts like the Declaration of Independence or religious texts like the one I just mentioned, the, the Buddhist Sutra or the Bible. And so I realized that when we think of literature just as what's on the fiction bookshelf, that's too narrow. Yeah. Because the real, to get at the real importance of written story, we need, I felt like I needed to expand and include these important political and religious stories. So that's sort of the through line. I tried to identify these important texts and to see what the important new writing technologies were. And each of my 16 episodes combines an important text with an important innovation. Yeah, now can we, can we uh, decipher through these, which are myths, history? Um, in a way, I think we can. Um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the Homeric epics, uh, and they're a, a good uh, example. So for a long time, people, later readers of the Homeric epics, thought that they were fiction, that it was just all made up. But there were a few dissenters, including a hobby archaeologist by the name of Schliemann, yes. who started to dig for Troy and actually found it. Right. And, and of course, that doesn't prove any aspect of the story, but it showed that there is a real historical source and core to a lot of these ancient epics. He, he read, he read uh, Homer and then went, <laughs> went exactly. there and dug. Exactly. And you also went to Troy. It's true. And what, uh, what, what did you, what's the biggest impression? I was there too. What did you yeah. find? You know, and, and I think you may have the same impression. I had, of course, loved 
uh, uh, Homer of and course. the Iliad and these grand stories of these clashing armies, the, the Greek army encamped before the mighty city of Troy for many, many years. And then you arrive there and it's tiny. It's really it's small, small. Yes. and, and <laughs> you know, I was first disappointed, uh, but then I thought about it and I said, you know, that's the power of literature. It made me imagine this yeah. as much bigger than it really was. Yeah, yeah, but uh, then you, the, you traveled uh, through the cities of uh, w what was, um, uh, what's now Turkey, the coast of right. Turkey, which right. was all Greek uh, cities, and so much history, the, a lot of the uh, New Testament of the Bible uh, takes place there, the book of Revelations was written there and so yeah. on. Yeah, that's true, and that's part of what interested me, but I was also interested in following in the wake of Alexander the Great, because he became a real key to my understanding of Homer, because he also was an avid reader oh, yes. of Homer. He kept it under his pillow. Exactly. Throughout his entire Asian campaign, he, he took his copy of Homer and he slept on it every night. And he really thought of his conquest of Asia as a basically a reenactment of these much older stories yes. that he had grown up with. Yeah. In fact, the first place he goes to when he, when he, when he enters uh, Asia Minor is Troy, even though it plays no military importance. And he, 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 ra he raced around the city the yeah. way Achilles did, <laughs> and he looked for old looked armor. For Hector, yeah, yeah <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it really shows that this one reader by reading the, the, the Iliad, reshaped history. Yeah, uh, we're, we're talking with Professor Martin Puckner, and his book is a beautiful book called The Written World, which uh, I, I, li I really loved. And um, when, when, you, when you went to Troy there, um, you, you knew Greek already, right? You had studied uh, Greek. You read, you read Homer in the original, right? I mean, so uh, yes and no. I don't want to exaggerate. I did study ancient Greek. But when you study ancient Greek, the ancient Greek you study is a little later. It's the Greek of, Ho of oh, Plato uh, and yes, Aristotle. That's right, that's right. So those I have read in Greek, though I don't know that I could do that anymore. The Homeric Greek is much That's harder. Right. So I can read translations and then go back to the original. But if you gave me, you know, I, I've never read the, the Iliad from beginning to end in Greek. I don't think I could do that. You know, I spent some time um, in uh, Upper Egypt, that is south of Egypt, and um, looking at all the hieroglyphs. And uh, they occur and reoccur and reoccur. And uh, you could see a pattern in this. I could see that um, one could read those. It's not like right. uh, reading hieroglyphics as we, right. well, uh, as we saw. But you, you talk about all kinds of history. You bring up someone uh, called Mosaki from... Um, M From Murasaki, Shikubo, Murasaki, yeah. Murasaki, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's a very moving story for me. So yes. one of the things that happens when you take sort of the bird's eye view of, um, of, of literary history, you, you become attuned to the moment when important new forms of writing, important new genres first develop. Uh, and so that was one example. So Murasaki Shikibu was a lady in, writing, uh, in waiting at, at the court of Japan uh, in Kyoto. And so in, in that position, she had keen insight into the inner workings of the court, which is very secretive, very hard to get to, very hidden. And she observed that court and started to write about it just for that small coterie readership. And they loved these stories set in their own world. And so she kept adding to them, observing exactly the, the social mores, the, the social codes, the way in which power intersected with personal relationships, how that whole court society was organized. And she just kept writing and writing and writing. And by the end, she had written what's now called a, the tale of Genji. Yeah. It's over a thousand pages. But what she had also done, she had invented the modern novel as we know it, again, hundreds of years before it was reinvented in, in Europe. Uh, what, what century are we talking about? So we are talking about the 10th, 11th uh -huh. century. And so the most moving thing about it is that she, she was a woman, and as a woman, she, she was literate because she, because she became, came from the minor aristocracy, 
but women were not really inducted into the deep literary history of Japan, which meant at the time Chinese literature. That was sort of the source literary tradition, much the way in which Greek literature was the source for Roman literature. So in order to teach herself uh, 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 Chinese uh, literature, she spied on her brother uh -huh. as he was being tutored and mm. that way taught herself and that put her in a position then later, once she had become a lady in waiting, to, to write about her experience in a way that was both modern, because she really developed psychological insight, kind of psychological realism that we now associate with, with the novel, but she also incorporated lots of poems and references to the deep literary tradition, including the, the Chinese literary tradition to which she otherwise would not have had yeah, access. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great story. Yeah, beautiful. Let's go to India, um, which you talked about a little bit before. When did the Vedic writings begin? Well, it's interesting. The Vedas themselves begin very early, yes. but they remain primarily an oral tradition for a really long time. Yeah. In fact, the Brahmins really tried to avoid writing because they felt that once the Vedas were written down, that they would lose, in a sense, control over them. Because oh, once you've written it oh. down, other people can access it, uh -huh. other castes might access it. It was a way of preserving power. And in a sense, it's still true today. Of course, they've long been written down, but there's still this importance placed on the oral, the oral reci tradition. recitation yeah. of the oral tradition. And that is also true of the, of the Indian epics, that they were trans admitted orally, also true of, of, of Homer, of Homer and, and, of course, and, yeah. uh, but and, for a and much uh, longer time. And the Quran as well. That, well, the, the, the Quran is a, an interesting story. So Muhammad probably didn't know how to write. Uh, he received the Quran by oral inspiration, but he then dictated it to a scribe. And so it was written down not by him, but during his time by a scribe, right. so it's a it's a very it, it's a it's a mode of transmission that sort of combines oral traditions and writing at the same time. Yes, you talk a lot about scribes and uh, yes. the relationship of the master and the scribe. Socrates didn't know how to write. Yes. I talked against writing. Yes, um, yes. And uh, I, I want to jump forward now to uh, the development of print. Yeah. In the, in in Europe. In we, Europe, we knew it developed in. In China. China, that's right, in China, in East Asia. And what we don't know exactly is how much Gutenberg knew about East Asian print. He probably knew something. And, and um, he also inherited a paper from East Asia that came to Europe via the Middle East, via the Arab occupied part of Spain to Europe. And pr paper was another important precondition for print, for the mass production of of books. But so the interesting thing about Gutenberg isn't so much that he had sort of this one breakthrough idea of print with, with movable type because that existed before, especially in East Asia. What he was, he was sort of an, a genius, I think of him as an entrepreneur, the sort right. of Steve Jobs of his <laughs> time, because he realized that print, which was very clunky and only used for like printing cards and little texts, had much more potential and he basically set up a kind of industrial production process. He reinvented every part of that process and really created a kind of mass production uh, uh, laboratory. And, and, and that's what he did. And the first thing he printed, it's much like the story about the, the Diamond Sutra, a religious text that becomes an early adopter of print in, in China. So again, in Northern Europe, the first big text Gutenberg prints is the, is the Latin Bible. So again, a kind of foundational religious text um, is an early adopter. I know, he got a lot of flack for that because um, uh, the priests didn't want people to read the Bible. Well, so that it's an interesting story. So the church at first was actually really into the idea of print because they realized that Gutenberg could produce more beautiful Bibles more cheaply. But it's true that they didn't think of these Bibles, which were still Latin Bibles, for ordinary people. They thought of these Bibles for churches and monasteries. Uh, but then 
print had such a transformative, powerful effect yes. democratizing literature that about 70 later, years later, uh, Martin Luther and completely unknown monk from Wittenberg uh, starts to translate the Bible into the language of the people, into German, and prints it, and then suddenly the church loses control over its text. And the same then happens with Tyndale when he translates the Latin Bible into English. And so ultimately, print had this effect of basically democratizing, democratizing li literature. Yeah. Uh -huh. The church lost, track of, uh, lost control over its text. But it wasn't true in the beginning. And so in the beginning, the church thought, wow, print is perfect for us. Uh -huh. And they didn't foresee the irony that print was the technology that well, made them lose out. One of the, the most end. interesting chapters is the chapter about Martin Luther. And I think you said that in his lifetime, a third of all printed yeah. texts were, were, were from him. Yeah. yeah he, he really uh, used the, the printed word. And he, he, he did. And I think, you know, he, I think of him really as, and I know it's a loaded word to use these days, but I think of him as one of the first populists because he used a new technology that basically allowed him to circumvent old centers of authority, the court and the, the church, and he used that to communicate directly with ordinary people. And he figured out this technology and the populist potential uh, really early on. Yeah, well, we've, uh, we've really changed a lot. Now we have public libraries where someone can, can take out a book. Uh, the oldest one, I think, uh, in the United States is is here in uh, Boston. Is mm -hmm. that the it, oldest one? It, uh, well, the oldest. I mean, oh. it's it's an so, the the oldest library is probably whatever Harvard had in in its uh, early days. Seventeen books, I think. It, it something was. like yes. that. <laughs> yes. so, something like that. But you introduce us actually to the first librarian. Would you tell us about him, Ash uh, Ban? Uh, Ash Urbanipal. Ash Urbanipal. Yeah. yeah. Well, that returns us in a yeah. way to the Epic of Gilgamesh because he was the Assyrian uh, uh, king who fell in love with the epic of Gilgamesh. He was an unusual in that he as a king himself knew how to write and to read the very difficult cuneiform script. Usually kings didn't bother with that very difficult uh, uh, skill they had scribes for mm. that purpose. But he himself, in part because he hadn't been originally in line to become king, had been sent to scribal schools and been inducted into the, the skill of writing. And so he fell in love with these ancient, what even he uh, considered mm. ancient texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh. And so he collected many copies of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it was his library that burned down and thanks to his collection of these clay tablets that ultimately uh, the epic survived. But libraries play a big role. Of course, I write about the Library yeah, of do. Alexandria. Yes. I write about the, the Library of Pergamon, Pergamon, which again is important for the technological story of literature because in Pergamon, the monks, the, and li uh, sorry, the librarians developed what we call parchment, pergamentum in Latin, named after the Library of Pergamon, a way of producing or a writing surface with scratch, stretched animal skin. And the reason they did that and were very invested in, in that is because of their rivalry with the Library of Alexandria. Alexandria was in a perfect place for a library because it was near the Nile Delta where papyrus grows so well. And the libraries of, of Pergamum in, in what's today Turkey became, were tired of depending on the export of papyrus. So they became, wanted to become aut autonomous yes. and invented parchment. Uh, tell us now, we've, uh, where are we today? We've talked about all these texts yeah. from China, from, from Japan, from uh, Europe. Where are we today? Yeah, you know, where we are today was really my most important question. In a sense, I went back because we lived through this unusual time of a real revolution in writing technologies with the internet that changes how stories are being written, how they are read, how they are distributed. And that also means what kinds of stories are being written down now. And so in a sense, what I did is look at the prehistory of our own moment, the 4,000 years of writing technologies, the different moments when new technologies changed the way we tell stories. And so when I looked, from that long history to the present, I see both real change, but I also see 
some uh, uh, ret almost returns to the past. We started with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Clay tablets were used for that. Mm -hmm. Then tablets completely went out and papyrus scrolls and books like the book you see in front of you yeah. became the main formats. But today we have tablets again for the first time. Yes. <laughs> and, and you know, when I look at my students who sit cross-legged on the floor with their tablets in, in their hands, exactly. they look like images of Egyptian scribes exactly. in the same pose. So I have a couple of images yeah. like that. Same thing with scrolling. The scroll gave way to the book because it's much easier to flip through pages and so on and so It's easier to transport. But today we scroll down computer screens again yeah. because computers exactly. encode text as a continuous text like scrolls. I mean, the computers simulate pages, but they're really scrolls. So there are some funny returns from the deep history of, of writing. But of course, the main, main change is that once again, a new technology is profoundly democratizing the, the access uh, to literature. Almost every, anyone can become an author today. That's never been true before. And I think with all the qualms I might have also about you know, students only looking at their cell phones or you know, attention deficit disorder, I share some of these concerns. But in the end, I think I'm quite uh, optimistic about it because I think never in the history of humankind was a time when more texts were being written by more people by more kinds of people and read by more people than today. So I think we are living through a real second explosion of literature after the print revolution. And it may take some time for the effects to shake out, uh, but I think it's a source of optimism and I'm excited about living through that unusual time. What about uh, putting U instead of uh, the, the letter U instead of Y-O-U? <laughs> do, you, do, you do you get upset about that? I don't get upset about it because there too is a funny return. I mean, all the emoticons, they're like Egyptian hieroglyphics. Exactly. Yes. You yes. know, yes. even there we, we, we go back. So the history of writing is a moment of changes and revolutions and improvements in many ways, a history of democratization. But I almost feel like nothing that ever existed is entirely lost. It keeps coming back in new forms. Excellent way to end the program. This is um, New England Authors. We have the pleasure of having a wonderful conversation with Professor Martin Puckner. His book is a beautiful book, The Written World. Uh, world, the written world. Um, we're uh, recording here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and broadcast on stations throughout New England. If you want to get in touch with us, contact your local station or contact the Curiosity Foundation website. Remember, watch locally. Thank you. Mm -hmm.